Thanks for the introduction. What I'm talking about today is focus fusion. Now what is focus fusion? It's a neutronic fusion using the dense plasma focus device. Which raises the further question, what is a neutronic fusion? And my colleagues have talked a little about this, but it's worth repeating. A neutronic fusion is fusion with fuels that produce no neutrons and therefore no radioactive waste, such as especially hydrogen and boron, which come together to produce only helium nuclei and no neutrons. And the great advantage of that is without any neutrons, you don't get any radioactive waste. So that's an enormous enor environmental safety factor because the only products are helium nuclei. There's another big advantage, which is an economic advantage. So with aneutronic fusion, we potentially have something that's cheaper than any existing energy source. This is probably the only clean energy source that is actually could be cheaper than existing sources. And the reason is with a neutronic fusion we can use direct energy conversion. We don't have to produce heat, to produce steam, to run turbines and generators which we've been doing such, since Edison and which is very expensive. So that's a second big advantage. The easiest way to talk about the dense plasma focus is to look at plasma in the universe on the largest scales. Now for those of you who aren't fusion physicists, when we talk about plasma, we're talking about the electrically conducting fourth state of matter in which the fusion reactions take place. The one thing that should be understood about plasmas at all scales in the universe is that they are unstable. One reason they're unstable is that Currents moving in the same direction through the plasma attract each other. This and other effects create filamentation instability, which drives currents to produce very dense, small filaments at all scales. Now, what we do in the plasma focus is we attempt to utilize these instabilities, a series of such instabilities, to drive the energy density higher and higher until we have fusion reactions. So this is the very different than the approach that you hear from most of our fusion colleagues, which is about trying to get the plasma to be stable, to sit still. We're reproducing these instabilities in a way to utilize them within this device. Now the device that we are using has as its core just two simple electrodes a cathode and an anode on the inside. These are the actual electrodes that I'm holding in my hand. They're not a scale model, so you get some idea of how compact this device is. Now these electrodes are placed inside a vacuum chamber that has the fuse and fuel, and they're attached to an energy source like this capacitor bank, these blue objects. Now, when the capacitor bank fires, you get a current sheath forming, and the current sheath breaks up into filaments. The filaments proceed down to the end of the anode, and they fountain together into the, what's called the focus, and they merge into a single filament. Now, this filament then has its own instabilities. It kinks up into a dense ball of plasma which we and other colleagues call the plasmoid. This plasmoid is confined by its own magnetic fields and it has its own instabilities because it produces beams, electrons in one direction and ions in the other. These beams, as well as other processes, heat up the ions within the plasmoid until you get fusion reactions. Now we've actually observed these plasmoids and other researchers who were using the same device have observed these plasmoids. This is at our lab in uh, Middlesex, New Jersey. We've taken pictures, photographs of these 
plasmoids. They appear in essentially every shot. Right now, we're using this device, the Focus Fusion 1 device, and we fire it about once every 15 minutes. In an actual generator, this device would be firing about 200 times a second. Now, this is a photograph of the plasmoid superimposed on a photograph of the uh, anode. So this gives you a bit of an idea about the scale. We'll show more details in the afternoon. So the machine would operate by repetitively cycling through this series of instabilities. In an actual generator, the energy would be absorbed in two forms. One is the x-rays produced would be absorbed in a sort of multi-layered photoelectric uh, effect generator, which is this onion-shaped object. And then the ion beam, which is moving electric charges, so by definition is already electricity, would be captured by essentially a sort of high-tech transformer symbolized by this coil. So a device like this firing about 200 times a second, about as often as your car fires its, in, its uh, spark plugs, would produce about 5 megawatts of power, enough to run a small town. So let me just break briefly at this point. I'm going to go on to see if we can have one question. Anybody has one question about how this works, and then I'll go on to talk about what we've accomplished. Is this clear to everybody? No questions? What, what's the strength of the magnetic field of these plasmoids? Well, we'll get into that more in the afternoon. At the moment, it's about 60 megagauss, but it's going to go up from there. So that's uh, uh, 6 kilotesla. But is it not that the device is going for you to advertise? Did I say contribution to basic science? Yes. and. I have to say, in contradiction to the previous speaker, we do think that at the moment this is still scientific research. It's advanced scientific research with a applied goal, but we're still doing science here. Do you have your measurement field somehow? Yes, we'll go into that in the afternoon. So let's go on to basically what we have accomplished very briefly. Next slide. So. Basically, where we are is we've achieved two of the three conditions that we need for net energy. First of all, and this is key, we have achieved the extremely high temperatures that are needed for PB11 fusion, which is about 1.8 billion degrees K, about 160 keV. And that is actually breaks a 30-year standing record for the temperatures observed with this device. Second of all, we do have the necessary confinement time that we're aiming for, which is about 20 nanoseconds, not very long. What we don't have yet is density. At the moment, our density is a factor of 10,000 below where we aim for, but we do think we know how to get there. So, roughly, what is your density in the cubic centimeter? It's uh, about eight times ten to the nineteenth per cc right now. So, where does this put us roughly compared with the other people who are working on a neutronic fusion? Well, this is a rough graph, and people can correct it, of log temperature versus log n tau density confinement time. This is where we are. This is where we need to be. And this, at least until this afternoon when we learn more, is where I think Trialpha is and where IEC roughly is translated to N tau. We are, at the moment, at this snapshot, orders of magnitude closer to the goal. Now, that doesn't mean we're necessarily going to be the one to reach the goal first. But we do have the shortest path. So we're very glad to see that our work has been achieving the attention of our, our peers. We were very glad that last year, 
in Physics of Plasma, which is the leading journal in our field, the most read article was our article reporting on these record high confined temperatures. And we've gotten a little media coverage, but we certainly need more, a lot more. So where does this put us in terms of what next? Well, our immediate goal is to achieve the high densities we need using deuterium fuel, which is easy to work with. Then we're going to transition to PB11 fuel with essentially the same device modified for that fuel and aim for scientific feasibility, more energy out than in in a laboratory advice. Then we would need a much larger engineering uh, effort to get a commercial prototype. Now people ask, how long is this all going to take? And we all know the joke in fusion is that fusion is always 30 years away. Now with a neutronic fusion, we're always four years away. But, <laughs> but seriously speaking, the key ingredient for us is really money. At the moment, our effort has been, over the past five years, we've spent $3 million. We have a full-time staff of three. Now, even with all the help we've been given with uh, everybody we're working with, with our international collaborators in the US, Iran, Japan, and elsewhere, that's just not enough. We need more people. We need the money to hire them. If we get this money, we can meet the goals that were on the previous slide. If not, I think we'll get there, but it'll take a good deal longer. And I don't think this should be all private money. I really want to second Bruno's sentiments. It is terrific that Google has organized this event today, but when is the United States Department of Energy going to organize a similar event? And I think perhaps we could all agree that we should be asking the United States Congress to look at the U.S. fusion program and say, see whether it cannot be redirected from the narrow focus on ITER and on the tokamak generally to a much broader expanded program that includes all of these good ideas and especially the routes to a neutronic fusion. And I think that that would be the fastest way to get environmentally safe, cheap, clean, and unlimited energy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? The you, you propose will use a photoelectric effect to convert x-rays into electricity and a uh, ion beam transformer to, uh, to turn hot ions into electricity without using a heat engine. Uh, what are the state-of-the-art demonstrations of those technologies outside of your laboratory? Are those uh, well in hand, or are they uh, new inventions that need to enable a machine like this? Yes and no. One is, one is not. Um, basically, the technology to convert an ion beam directly into electricity by inducing electricity in a circuit is extremely similar to uh, the technology to convert an electron beam into electricity. That's a very mature um, set of technologies with uh, devices such as, I'm just going to name Gyrotron as one of them. There are designs that have been highly tested for megawatt devices that could produce energy at the 80% efficiency level. So one of these devices is what you would call a mature technology, which we could probably just adapt. The other device, the multi-layered X-ray photoelectric device, is our own patented invention. It's part of our patent. It's an engineering challenge. There's no doubt about it. It's never been built in the lab. Um, the physics is pretty straightforward. The key challenge would be able, would uh, basically be the ability to take the energy that isn't converted out, in other words, cooling. 
So it's definitely an engineering challenge uh, that, that would have to be met at that final, uh, at the second stage of, of development. And, and what fraction of the energy produced by a machine like this comes out in X-rays versus ion energy? Our calculations are about two-thirds ions, about one-third X-rays. Yes. Is the ion being neutralized or is it uh, uh, unneutral? Well, basically, it's it's um, it's space charge neutralized, but the current is not neutralized within the beam. In other words, the return current is outside the beam, and we can see that directly because we measure this current with a Rogowski coil. So we're measuring a big net current, as I'll talk about in the, uh, in the afternoon. We've measured beams that have net currents that uh, are in the hundreds of kiloamps. OK, sounds like an afternoon question, though. Thanks. Right. Yep. Yes? How do you turn isotropic, going every direction, alpha energy, into? The, the alphas come out going in all directions. Uh, how? Well, from the reaction, they come out going in all directions. And now the question is, what causes them to go straight down that, or, or some current, to go straight down this particular angle, narrow angle, that you're headed out? Well, fortunately, we don't have to worry about it, because the plasmoid does it for us. And this has been observed not only by us, but by literally dozens of, of groups. The plasmoid is in what some of you might call a spheromac configuration. It's a minimum energy configuration. But it has an instability, which again, I'll go into in the afternoon, which creates a tremendous electric field along the axis right, of the plasmoid. It accelerates the particles out along those lines. But that's the now, the magnetic field. field is sufficiently strong to trap the alpha particles. So the alpha particles are circling around, and they get swept up in the exhaust along with the, you know, whatever other particles you have in there. But, but many people would think that beam was driven by your electromagnetic input, not driven by the alpha particles. So you've got to be continually driving that beam. You're not going to get the energy from the fusion to be that current. No, but what, what's going to happen? when you have enough energy for, from fusion to, to make a difference, is your beam is going to come out carrying the electromagnetic energy that accelerates the beam, but you're also be going to be carrying the thermal energy that has been created by the fusion reactions. You're basically going to get a beam that's wide in thermal energy, and if you do the calculations, it's very easy to tell that you're getting the extra energy out in, in that way. So you get both the energy you put in and the fusion energy out. 